Good morning. Mighty man of God, Seth Hart and his family, his beautiful family. The newest addition. Tell me the baby's name. Joseph. Joseph. There you go. Mighty man of God. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Seth is going to lead the men's retreat, Trace Diaz, in a couple months. So Seth, I just want to remind you, God handpicked you. Circumstance didn't pick you. God picked you long before. Long before we were surprised by circumstance, God already orchestrated and hand anointed you to lead over a hundred and some odd men into a closer walk with the Lord. Amen. Amen. So uh, as God anoints, he equips and God's anointed you and equipped you with the men that surround you for guys you don't even know who are coming yet. <laughs> Amen. And uh, so God's just going to bless you with a special anointing and a special time with him because you can't take somebody where you haven't already been. And so God's going to take you very close to him so that you can say, hey, guys, let me tell you what, what God showed me. Amen. So I'm glad you're here, brother. Amen. John chapter 17, verse 20. I want to read this. And uh, I want you to, uh, to read this with me and uh, just ask the Lord to speak to you. John chapter, 20, uh, John chapter 17, I'm sorry, verses 20 through 26. It says this, this is Jesus. Jesus is praying. If you have a, a red letter Bible, these letters are in red. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus is with his closest friends, his best friends. So Eric, if you were there, you would be in that group. Jesus' best friends. He has his 12 closest disciples around him. He has spent life with them. He has showed them the miraculous. He has taught them things that have completely shattered their ideas, their agendas. He has completely taken them out of their humanity and brought them into his godhood. He has brought them into his plan, his agenda. And so just as in our lives, God breaks our agendas, amen, and we all say, thank you. God, break our plans. God, break our mindsets. God, the Bible says our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. So I don't really want Cameron's ways. I don't want Cameron's thoughts. I know that my ways, my thoughts are not his ways. So I have to constantly yield and say, God, give me your thoughts. Give me your ways. Amen. So these disciples... God has completely taken them out of their realm and brought them into the supernatural kingdom realm. He has taught them and taught them and, ex and, and explained to them over and over. He has done things that they never thought possible. Jesus, as he prays this prayer, knows that he's fixing to go to the cross. The disciples are still somewhat confused by that. They still don't understand that. They still don't get the, the gravity of that situation. But Jesus completely knows where he is headed. He completely knows that his time on earth is very short. And just as you take the words of a dying person extremely serious, just as we, when someone is on their deathbed, they gather around them, the ones they love, and they say things that maybe they've never said. They express things that maybe they have not expressed. They do things that are extremely important. So this is Jesus's last words not just for himself, not for his disciples, but for you and I. Amen? These words are written for anyone who believes in him. So John chapter 17, verse 20, it says, this is Jesus speaking, I do not pray for these alone, talking about his disciples, but I also for those who will believe in me through their word. So I don't pray for just the disciples, but I'm praying for Cameron. I'm praying for you. Put your name in scripture. I'm praying for Whitestone Church. I'm praying for America 2014. I'm praying for the world today. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they, who's they? Say me. So that us, so that we, so that they may be what? One. Jesus says, Father, I'm not just praying for my disciples, but I'm praying for those who will believe in me because of my disciples' words, and my prayer is that, that they will be one. As you, Father, are in me, 
Jesus, and I, Jesus, are in you, the Father, that they, Whitestone Church, also may be one in us. Jesus' prayer is that we will be one with God. That they may be one whoops, with us. That the world may believe that you sent who? Listen, if you didn't just catch it, that's huge weight on you and I. If you didn't just see that, that is a huge responsibility just put on us. Father, I pray that Whitestone Church be one. I pray that Cameron and Stacy Corbin be one. I pray that the family of God be one so that the world will know that you, Father, sent me Jesus. Why does the world today question Jesus is the Messiah of the, of the world? Why does the world question today that Jesus is who he said he is? Why does the world question today the validity of the deity, the Godhead of Jesus Christ? Because they don't see one in his followers. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Father, I pray not just for these disciples, who these disciples were becoming one. A ragtag team of misfits, guys who had been rejected, went back to their jobs. Nobody would choose them. Jesus went and chose them to be his followers. Over the course of three and a half years, he molded them to gel together, not just with each other, but most importantly with Jesus himself. And when we're one with Jesus, when we're one with God, being one with each other becomes very easy. Amen? Amen. An indication that you're not right with God the Father is in an indication in your relationship with others. If your relationship with others is all out of whack, that is an indication that you may not be one with God the Father that you claim to be one with. It says this, I'm going to read again. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that also they may be one in us, that also the church may be one in us, so that when they are one with us, the world will then believe that you sent me. It's all about Jesus, amen? It's not about us. It's not about our agenda. It's not about our knowledge. It's not about our denomination. It's not about our rights. It's not about our beliefs and our doctrine and our theology and our stances. It is about Jesus Christ. The number one indicator that the world is looking at is at the body of Christ. Where does the body of Christ start? It starts in our homes. If Stacy and Cameron are not one with God and in our relationship, why would you pay attention to us when we tell you that there's somebody greater and his name is called Jesus? Why would you believe that if we are two and we are split and we're divided? You wouldn't. You would question the source. We're not perfect. Trust me. Hang out one day and you'll go, oh my God, that's our pastors. <laughs> Lord, listen, there's split, but listen, we strive to be one through forgiveness, through mercy, through grace, through love, through patience, through kindness, through gentleness. Amen? Amen? Why would the neighbors across the street and the people down the street in Lakeway and down the way in Cedar Park and Austin, why would they listen to the message of Whitestone Church if they look at the church and they see division, the conflict, backbiting, lying, cheating, all this garbage? Why would they believe the message of Jesus when they look at us and say, man, they ain't even got it together? Come on, that's good preaching. <laughs> why? That's good because it's truth. Why would the city of Austin trust the message of the church if Whitestone Church is divided against United Lakeway Methodist Church and if Whitestone Church is divided against Hill Country Bible Church or Hope Chapel or Shoreline or Celebration or First Baptist or First Lutheran or First EV Free or First whatever, no denomination, 
church under the bridge, if they see division the amongst the body of Christ, why would Austin want what we got? Austin looks at the church and they say, what? You can't even get it together. So therefore, we reject Jesus because his followers are all divided. That church is scary. That church is heavy. Amen? The question is this. How one are you? How in unity with the body of Christ are you? How one are we with the Lord? Amen? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. A mighty man of God, Pastor Hawks, shared this verse at a pastor's conference this last week. And your pastor has not been the same since. Because the Lord hit me with a two by four and maybe a four by four and it may have been a ton of bricks. I don't know what it was. But a light bulb went off in my head that has not previously been turned on. And I thought, oh my God, what are we doing? Listen, it is not about Whitestone Church. Say that with me. It is not about Whitestone Church. It is not about my denominational belief. It is not about my non-denominational belief. It is not about my label. It is not about my doctrine. It is not about my theology. It is about Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Jesus says, they will know that you're a Christian by your what? Doctrinal statement? Belief? Your actions? Your money in the offering plate? Your biblical memorization and, and hermeneutical skills of, right? I don't even know what I just said. Actually, I do, but is that what we're judged by? No, we're judged by our love. They will know you are a Christian by your love. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 as I threw my Bible around and lost my place, getting all excited. Listen to this. Now concerning things offered to idols, Paul's talking about serious business. Idols. What's an idol? An idol is anything, say it with me, anything that I put before God. Some of us, we could sit back and go, I ain't got no idols. Yeah, you probably don't have a traditional idol in your house, like a little statue that you went out in your yard and you cut down a tree and you carved out this little statue of an animal or a thing and you set it up on your, your, above your fireplace and you kneel down and worship that every night. I bet you don't have that kind of idol in your house. But an idol is anything that would dare exalt itself before God. Amen? He says, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that all have knowledge. Say, I have knowledge. You really do. Believe it or not, I got some knowledge. I know that's hard to believe. But we have knowledge. What's our knowledge? My idol could be my 401k bank account because my knowledge says, yeah, I've got plenty of cash. I got plenty of reserves. I got plenty of money. So therefore, I'm good. My knowledge tells me that my money can satisfy me in bad times. Hey, I got laid off. But my knowledge tells me I got a PhD and this and this, and I got, a, I got all the accolades, all the degrees, all the certificates. I can go get a job based on my knowledge of my expertise. Hey, I'm good. I don't need that friend. My knowledge tells me I've got 200 other friends. Hey, my not, listen, our knowledge, my knowledge of scripture, this is where we're fixing to hit home. My knowledge of scripture 
Oh, I know the Bible. I'll never forget as a young man, listening to a man in my church. As the preacher was preaching, he said, oh, I've heard that story. I've heard, all. in fact, I've heard everything. Really? His knowledge told him that he had heard everything that the inexhaustible word of God could ever speak to him. All of a sudden, this became his what? His knowledge of this became his idol. Amen? Listen, now concerning knowledge, we all have knowledge. Now concerning things offered to idol, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge what? Puffs up. But love, say it with me. Listen, some of us want to walk around and we want to let our knowledge of this book puff itself up so that we go and we go to an unbeliever and we start pounding them with the knowledge that we've been given from God. And all of a sudden we've puffed ourselves up that we forgot how to love that person right where they're at and embrace them right where they're at and let our knowledge fade away. It would be better that we had a complete, uh, what's that thing where amnesia? Man, it'd be awesome for us just to have amnesia and to go love that person and tell them, listen, I don't know much, but I know that I love you and I know that Jesus loves you and I know that that's all that matters. Let's, let me introduce you to the guy that saved me. Let me introduce you to this man called Jesus Christ. But sometimes we want our knowledge to puff itself up and so therefore we start to claim the corner market on truth. Look at verse two, it's even scarier. If you want to leave, go ahead. <laughs> we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. Do you think that you know something? <laughs> Seriously, come on. Cameron Corbin thinks he knows it. And God says, Cameron, you don't know nothing. John 3, 16, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You think you know that verse? You think that you comprehend the gravity of that verse? You don't. I don't. Some people will say, oh, preacher, don't preach on something boring like John 3, 16. We know that already. Knowledge puffs itself up, and he who thinks he knows something doesn't know anything as he ought to know it. That's deep. Would you agree? Listen, unity in the body of Christ equals power. Jesus prayed, God, give them unity. God, give them oneness. God, if they will be one then the world will believe what they're talking about. Then the world will believe that you sent me, Jesus. But oh God, if they draw lines in the sand and they, they start saying, I'm not going to associate with so-and-so because they believe this and I'm not associating with them because we differ. If all of a sudden we're divided, oh my God. We are starting to puff self up. And God says, Cameron, you don't know nothing. Listen, I judged, I totally judged a pastor at a pastor's conference on Monday afternoon. You want me to, you want me to be honest? 77 pastors around the city gathered together for a 24-hour prayer service. Remember Explore God a couple months ago? How awesome was Explore God? 377 churches in Austin. They were all Baptist churches, Right? Oh, they were all Methodist churches, right? They were all Church of Christ, right? No, they're all, I don't, they were all non-denoms. No. Every version, flavor of Christianity you can almost think of joined together and says, yeah, we got different ways that we baptize, and yeah, we, got, we don't wear robes or we wear robes, whatever. 
Yeah, we, we do communion this way and we recite this creed and you don't. And we meet under a bridge and we meet in a really nice facility. They dropped all of that. Amen? 377. And we say, we rally around our knowledge. No. We rally around our knowledge. No. We rally around our love for a man named Jesus Christ. And we just want to tell the city of Boston as one voice, one body, that Jesus is who God sent to save the world. Amen? That's power. There's power in unity. Does God want us all to be cookie cutters? This idea, I was talking to Richard Brown. Richard Brown Construction, one of the finest home building, remodeling construction companies in the city, built this exact facility that you're sitting in. I said, Richard, how cool would it be if you were the only home builder in Austin and you built every home in Austin? That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? That would be impossible. In fact, no disrespect, he builds a great house, but Austin would look kind of boring. They would all look like the, his model of construction. He doesn't own the market, right? right? Different flavors, different varieties, different guys saying, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna architect the building to look this way and I'm gonna put doors here. And yeah, I like the way you put doors there, but I'm gonna do it this way and this way. Listen, the church of Christ, the body of Christ is just like that. God did not come and say, Cameron, I need you to be the only preacher in town. I need you to have the biggest church in town, and you're the only one that's cornered. The Holy Spirit's only coming to your church on Sunday. That's a lie from the pit of hell to cause division. The fact is the Spirit of God is all over this city right now, preaching through a variety of people in languages I don't even know, in cultures and, and ways that would be foreign to me and different and maybe even out of my comfort zone. But God says, listen, I don't want uniformity. I want unity. Amen? Yes. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet. But if anyone loves God, if anyone loves God, this one is known by God. Listen, church, we got to reach out. We got to embrace. I want you to start praying for Pastor Russell Daniel, Pastor's Palmer Lane Church. I don't even know the name of it. I forgot. 23 or 4 years old, single guy, pastor in a church. Does he need your prayer? Absolutely. Is he competition? No. You know who he's competition to? Hell. A unified church, a unified voice will make it hard to go to hell in Austin. That is our purpose. Amen. I do not care what Bible-believing, Jesus Christ-based church you go to. Go somewhere. Amen? That's strong. Would you agree? Okay. Did I make that point? All right. One more. Are you all okay? Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Acts chapter 2. We're in this Holy Spirit track, if you will. I don't know. I told Stacy, I said, I just feel like the Holy Spirit wants us on a journey of his power, his strength, his personality, his movement in the church, in our lives. The disciples, Jesus has gone. Jesus has now ascended. His last words were, hey, listen, all you followers, 500 of you, over 500, I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to wait on the promise and that promise is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll receive power to therefore go and love the unlovable. You'll receive power to have faith to believe. You'll receive power to walk through this life called Christianity. Amen? Without the Holy Spirit, you have zero power. You just have a mundane, religious, whatever. He says, wait on the Holy Spirit. Listen to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, there they were all with what? One accord in one place. One accord does not mean a Honda. It means unity. When the church, 
when the family, when the marriage drops their difference. Listen, husband and wife, you got a lot of knowledge about your spouse. Oh my God, does Stacy have some knowledge on me. I can't remember the knowledge that I have on her, but I know it was good, and I want to pull that out every time that she tells me something. Oh yeah, you remember back when you did? Yeah, it was really mean. That's what? It's knowledge. Oh, Cameron's knowledge of Stacy will puff Cameron up. And I will rip her apart. Oh, yeah? You remember this? I can remember some things. And then her knowledge of me? Oh, boy, will it rise up. But the truth is, I don't know nothing about that lady. I don't know nothing as I ought to know. She doesn't know nothing about me. 23 years, and I'm scratching the surface because God says, oh, Cameron, you think you know, but you don't know her. That's my daughter. There's such depth in that lady. There's such wisdom. Oh, you're just beginning, son. So set your foolish knowledge aside and love her. Amen? Oh, my knowledge against people I don't like. Right? Amen. Oh, my knowledge against people I don't like. Because I've got some knowledge. But oh, how it puffs me up <coughs> to make me think I've cornered the market on that truth or on that person. And God says, oh, Cameron, drop your knowledge. Because what you know, you don't know the way that you ought to know. You know who knows the way that they ought to know? That's me, God, Cameron. So why don't you lay all of your knowledge down and see that person? Allow me to open up your eyes. See that preacher on TV for who he really is. Not for who you think he is because your knowledge is so great and you've pegged him. Not, not, the, not the guy down the street that has this label of Christianity on him. And he's a little weird to you. Oh, Cameron, lay down your knowledge. Because that's my son. That's my daughter. You don't know him the way I know him. Amen? Listen, that same spirit will very clearly say, hey, Cameron, stay away from that. Because listen, that's, that's not my son or my daughter. That, that message... That's false. So Cameron, pray for him. Don't let your knowledge of the truth outweigh your love for that person even though they're going the absolute wrong way. Amen? Cameron, don't, don't let your knowledge against Stacy walk you all the way to divorce court because you don't know her the way I know her. Don't, don't write that employee off. I know they stole money from you and I know that they bad-mouthed you and I know they... They tried to take you down as they, as they left your company. But Cameron, you don't know them. Just lay your knowledge down. Because I need you to love them into the kingdom. Because Cameron, they're so lost. That's why they're spewing out all that. That sounds good, doesn't it? Is that good? Yes. Listen, through this fast, God's been breaking barriers in our life. And through this fast, God's been saying, lay the knowledge weapon down. Pick up the weapon of love and embrace each other. Homes first. Amen. Families first. You can't, I, I can't, the Bible says, Cameron, you can't be a preacher if, you're, if your family's a wreck. You know? Okay, your first church, your first ministry. Listen, God's not calling you into ministry till you first get things right in you and in home. Amen? God's fixing to take the church of Austin to a new level. I'm telling you, it's coming. Jesus said, cast out your nets on the other side of the boat, and the disciples did. You remember that story? And they caught all kinds of fish. All kinds of fish. 
There's going to be some fish that walk through the door that are of another kind. And you're going to go, whoa, that's another kind of fish. Never seen that fish before. Maybe they got proof of it all over there. I don't know. But it's a fish. And we ain't, we, we, sorry, we are not called to discriminate against the fish that Jesus brings into the house because he says you're a fisher of men. Not the chooser of men. You're the fisher of men. He's the chooser. Amen. So church, do this at home today. Maybe you need to embrace your spouse and say, would you forgive me of my knowledge of you? Because I have destroyed you with my knowledge. I don't know you the way I should know you. But oh, God does. And so I submit, God, I give you all my knowledge. Teach me how to love. Amen. Amen. Pastors across town, start praying for them. Don't start looking at them. I, looked, I told you I started a story and I didn't finish. And I know I'm going over, so if you need to leave, uh, it's okay. But I pegged this pastor as an old guy that didn't know nothing. You know why? Because he told me what label of Christianity he practiced. He said what his denomination was. As soon as I heard that, I thought, oh, man, I'm going to be stuck next to this guy. Oh, he doesn't know God. He just knows this form of God that I don't like because I don't agree with that form of God. Oh, really, God, did you sit me at this chair on purpose? And I start trying to worm around the room to find another spot. But guess what? They're all taken. Because we had to pick groups of three. And boy, wasn't that a genius choice. And you know what happened in that 10-minute interaction with this now I would call mighty man of God? He totally shattered my prejudice knowledge against his label or brand. And that guy, I don't know how old he is. He's old. <laughs> but that guy... At the end of that 10 minutes, I'm like, dude, we need to have lunch. You're a deep well. But oh, my prejudice and my knowledge would have never associated with him. I'm, I, that's embarrassing, but it's the truth. Amen? Amen. Say it with me, God, if you mean it, God, forgive my knowledge. Where it's puffed itself up. I want to make an exchange right now. To give you my biased. My prejudiced. My opinion. And my knowledge. And I just need a deeper level of love. In Jesus name. Amen. I appreciate your time this morning.